Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to a great spring in Minnesota. I'm Sue Gerberich, director of the Midwest Center for Occupational Health and Safety Education and Research Center. And I'd just wa like to welcome you to our center's annual uh, Nora Symposium, which is co-sponsored between our center and also the Upper Midwest Center for Agricultural Safety and Health, known as UMASH. We have um, terrific participation today that includes um, people from staff, faculty, students, um, lots of regional partners, advisory board members, um, and actually um, staffers from congressional offices. So we appreciate all of you being here today. We're especially honored today um, with our featured speaker who's going to address a topic of great importance to occupational safety and health. But before we commence, um, I do need to thank some um, very special contributors to this whole effort um, that have um, contributed significantly um, to putting this whole symposium together. So I'd like to recognize um, Pat McGovern, who's um, our deputy director of the center, and she's second from the left there. Um, Julie Elkhorn Webb, our center's continuing education director at the back. Um, Maggie Truax, Program Associate in the Centers for Public Health Education and Outreach. Diane Campa, Coordinator for the UMASH. Ruth, R Ruth Rasmussen, um, UMASH Outreach Director. Joyce Archibald, Associate Administrator, and um, she's our photographer today. You'll see her going around snapping all kinds of pictures. So. Um, Please cooperate with her. Um, we want to have lots of good pictures. Um, and then um, Karen Brademeyer, Office Supervisor. Deb Grove, our Fiscal Officer, very important. Um, Andy Ryan, Senior Research Fellow. And Ashley Reichard, our Office Assistant. So I just want to remind you to be sure to review the materials in your folder, um, including the list of excellent posters that are available for viewing um, after the or during the reception after the session. And then as you know, following the presentations today, um, presentation, um, we're going to be having a, a really nice reception um, with the viewing and opportunities for all kinds of networking and discussions. So at this time, um, I'd just like to introduce um, you to Dr. Bruce Alexander, who is director of the Upper Midwest Center for Agricultural Safety and Health, and also professor and director of our Division of Environmental Health Sciences. So thank you all for coming. Good afternoon. I do want to welcome everybody on behalf of the Division of Environmental Health Sciences and the Upper Midwest Agricultural Safety and Health Center. Uh, we're very excited to have our, um, our speaker today talking about total worker health and, and uh, topics is becoming increasingly important in some of the work we do. The Upper Midwest Agricultural Safety and Health Center, or UMASH, which is a lot easier to say, um, is um, a, a collaboration between not only the School of Public Health, but the College of Veterinary Medicine, the Minnesota Department of Health, and the uh, Marshfield Clinic. And one of the big issues we're dealing with now, in fact, many of our, um, our colleagues in UMASH can't attend today because they are dealing with the crisis in avian influenza, which is in, in impacting our agricultural community. Now, while this doesn't have any direct influenza risk necessarily for workers, it does certainly is impacting workers. And I think that fits in very nicely with the total worker health theme of this, of this um, presentation. So I wanted to welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Finnegan, who is a professor and dean of the School of Public Health. Thank you. And how many welcome speeches can you tolerate? <laughs> uh, thank you uh, all for being here. And uh, it is my privilege to welcome you to the School of Public Health, uh, of which the Division of Environmental Health Sciences is one of our four uh, divisions, the others being epidemiology and community health, biostatistics, and health policy and management, not in alphabetical order, thank you. Um, I, uh, 
I have to say that I think the topic for today, this concept of total worker health, is one that is extremely important for so many reasons. Um, we recently, I was engaged with the division, uh, a number of the faculty here, Dr. Jeff Mandel, Gurumurthy Ramachandran, Bruce Alexander, and others in the division, uh, in conducting, uh, and also the health department um, and others, in uh, uh, conducting, uh, I think, one of the best sets of studies that have been done on the issue of taconite workers' health. And uh, many of you uh, know that this largely resulted because of a, of a, a crisis, if you will, in, in the uh, rise of mesothelioma uh, uh, among taconite workers on the Iron Range. But one of the things that became very clear to me as we started to do this research is that it's not just about mesothelioma, it is about other things as well. It is about family, it is about community, it is about heart disease and heart health and all of these other things. So uh, today, a little bit earlier today, I did a uh, lecture for a group uh, of students, undergraduate students on the One Health model and we got into talking about the social ecological model that dominates in public health. And if you look at that model from a model in 1991, you will see work environment occupies an enormous part of that. So occupational health, I think, continues to be one of the most important things that we do in the arena of public health. And as we are looking at interprofessional education of health professionals, which is another big issue that's cutting across all the health professions, this concept of total worker health becomes even more important. So we're thinking more holistically, systematically, and organizationally. And I'm preaching to the choir, but it's the choir that's mainly going to sing this tune and get everybody else on pitch. So thank you for being here. Thanks so much, John. And don't worry, I'm not going to sing, <laughs> even if I'm part of the choir. So um, I'm Pat McGovern, and I'm deputy director at the Midwest Center for Occupational Health and Safety. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you our guest speaker tonight. So as John said, our focus this afternoon is on total worker health. And this is a concept branded by the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH, to encourage researchers and practitioners alike who are concerned with the health and safety of the workforce to expand our efforts from looking at traditional programs in occupational health and injury prevention to include health promotion and chronic disease prevention. And Dr. Kent Anger is one of a small pool of experts in this emerging area of intervention research. He is an experimental psychologist by training and a professor at Oregon Health Sciences University in Portland where he holds two joint faculty appointments in public health and preventive medicine and in behavioral neuroscience and medicine. He also serves as an associate director for applied research and as a senior scientist at the Oregon Institute of Occupational Health Sciences. This institute conducts basic and applied research, outreach, and education at the university with 75 uh, scientists, practitioners, and staff whose mission is to work to improve the health, safety, wellness of the workforce of Oregon and beyond. And their base funding is from Oregon's um, workers' compensation system that's augmented by NIH-type funding for their research grants. And Kent led that group's effort to write a successful application for the Oregon Healthy Workforce Center. This is now one of four research centers of excellence funded by, the, by NIOSH to design and test total worker health interventions. And I might add, we have friends and colleagues from Iowa who also have one of the centers here, and they're here too tonight, so we're delighted for that. So just to tell you a little bit about Kent Center, and then he'll tell you much more. Um, the Oregon Healthy Workforce Center has three research and two translation projects that share common methodologies to identify and address some of our vexing problems in chronic disease, occupational safety, and work-life balance in populations of workers that historically have been very hard to engage. Construction workers, independent home health care workers, police and public safety officers. 
And in every one of these interventions, they use randomized controlled trials to test the effectiveness of their interventions using team-based interventions and technology-based interventions. Additionally, he and his colleagues have garnered funding from the NIH and the Department of Army for studies addressing total worker health needs of long-haul truck drivers and veterans. Now before um, Ken joined the ranks of academia, he served as scientist, director, and chief of the neurobehavioral research section at NIOSH, where his work focused on neurotoxicology testing and risk assessment of chemicals, and he worked with animals in the lab. So when we were chatting last night, I was curious to find how he made this move from mice to men and women. And he said that there really are more similarities between the species than you might imagine. <laughs> and he said that actually all, all roads lead to behavior modification and conditioning. And he was a big fan of the American psychologist B.F. Skinner and the theory of behavioralism. So with those insights into human behavior and learning earned him many awards, including the Apple Distinguished Educator in Higher Education given by Apple Computer, and most recently the OHSU Faculty Senate Collaboration Award, where they recognize faculty members who have shown exceptional effort over the last decade in support of their mission. So with that, I'd like to warmly welcome Kent, and we look forward to learning more about what makes for an effective intervention in total worker health and the efforts of his center. So welcome. Thank you very much for that nice uh, introduction, Pat. Uh, they said that when everybody else left the stage, it was time to talk, so it must be time to talk. Um, <laughs> So it's a real pleasure to be here, and I appreciate the invitation, and particularly to talk about total worker health. So um, I am from the Oregon Healthy Workforce Center, and I should acknowledge, I want to acknowledge, that it's an affiliation of a number of other universities, as well as my own, Oregon Health and Science University, Portland State University, um, uh, the University of Oregon, and Kaiser Center for Health Research. And we even have Oregon State University uh, with a pilot project. So we've covered pretty much all of the Oregon major research universities. Um, I should also say that I do have a conflict of interest about something that I'll mention in the course of the talk. Um, of course, I, my university requires me to mention that, and what ha what's happened is that I've developed a computer-based training program, then created a company to license it from the university to then uh, sell it to other, other uh, individuals. And the purpose for that really was to evolve the training program that we couldn't do with NIH grants. And so that's been fairly successful. And I'll mention that uh, conflict of interest. What it means is I can't, you know, for research involving it, I can't consent subjects or uh, determine their eligibility, and I can analyze the data. Well, it turns out that it is really better if I don't analyze the data. So that has worked out just fine. Well, I'll take you back to the OSHA Act of 1970, and that's when the modern era of occupational safety and health really began in the United States. It began earlier in, in Europe and other parts of the world, but that's when it began for us, and that was about the time I started at NIOSH myself, was a little bit after that. And um, the, goal, the purpose of the Act, or the, the things that it designated or the, in the general duty clause, was that we would furnish um, a work employment that was free from recognized hazards and also that are uh, likely to cause death or serious physical harm to employees and to set standards. It was very much a chemically based uh, uh, approach that they were uh, talking about. That's what was the really big concern at that time. They also established, that act also established NIOSH, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, again, if anyone doesn't know that. And th their job, and that was my job at the time, was to conduct research and to establish recommended occupational safety and health standards. And that's what we did mostly. We spent a lot of time doing that. Um, but the only actual chemical that was identified to study was uh, lead-based paints. And so that was one of our, our focuses. And that's why me as a psychologist, doing behavioral research got involved in it because the, a lot of the research on lead-based paints was used uh, neurobehavioral tests. Well, another thing that that act established in 1970 was the Workers' Family Protection Act. And people don't realize that family was front and center at the beginning of the o OSHA Act. And what they were worried about at the time was people bringing chemicals home from work. The picture on the screen 
um, sort of full disclosure actually comes from Egypt, a uh, study that I did there, but that's an example of how people could be exposed to a chemical, pesticides in that case, and then bring it home, and then when it was being cleaned or when the person was with their, their family, they were exposed to that chemical. That was the big worry that they had, and that's what we were supposed to study. Well, from the beginning, NIOSHA hired people to study issues of that sort, to study family issues and, and uh, home issues and recognizing that what happens at home as, uh, affects what happens at work and vice versa. Well, it was around uh, 2003 when NIOSH took, I'd say, the next really large step, and they began the Healthier Workforce Initiative um, in the United States, and they did that in combination with the American Psychological Association as to focus on uh, healthier workforces. Shortly thereafter, they established three centers of excellence um, to study that area, and they actually renamed it the work-life area. So in 2007, they had the work-life symposium. So they were renaming it uh, at that point in time. And then in 2011, they renamed it again, and they called it the Total Worker Health Program or initiative that they, that they launched. And they trademarked it, as Pat said. They trademarked the term Total Worker Health so that nobody else could use it and so they could define it themselves. And so they've defined it, and then they've redefined it as well. Um, so there were three centers of excellence refunded then in 2011 at about the same time, and that's when the Oregon Center was funded, and that's what we felt was the signal accomplishment of the uh, Total Worker Health Program, but just kidding. <laughs> there, there are people from Iowa, the other center, one of the other centers in the audience, and I'm sure they uh, look back to when they were funded as really the important time. Well, if you look at where these centers are around the country, they're in Oregon and Iowa, and then two on the, on the East Coast. And it's important, NIOSH, is, uh, now that we have four centers, because with three centers, it was really, uh, really, the critical mass was barely there, and it's not even clear that it's there at this time. But they did want us to become regional centers. And so we needed to establish a region that we would um, provide service and support and, and uh, stimulate work in uh, uh, total worker health in. So we've identified our region as this <laughs> large. <laughs> so I didn't know there'd be people from Iowa here. I might have changed it a little bit. <laughs> Are they taking pictures? I don't know. So, <clears throat> And those of you who are really looking closely might say, well, now, wait a minute. Is Minneapolis in that area? So we added a rump area that included Minnesota, just so that you're, we know that you're in our heart and you're in our region. So we're happy to reach out and do things with you. So, okay, what is Total Worker Health? Um, total Worker Health is really a strategy for integrating traditional occupational safety and health, which was renamed uh, or gave, given the initial name of health protection along the way, along with well-being and personal, and personal health, because they are interrelated. And if you think about the third of the time that you spend at work and the two-thirds of the time that you spend not at work, maybe at home, maybe somewhere else, um, you can see that things that happen at home and at work really, or outside of work and at work, really relate to each other. Dietary habits that we develop when we're at work or in non-work settings uh, uh, work, move over into the other areas. So work and non-work really are combined in so, many, in so many different areas. And you just can't separate them. I mean, I know our health systems separate them. There's workers' compensation. Something happens to you at work, and then there's the health care system if something help, happens outside. But things aren't just um, happening only at work or only outside. And, and we recognize that, and NIOSH was recognizing that as well. And whether it's in the smokestack industries that we kind of started with in, in occupational safety and health, or the current information industry that we have so much of, we had significant uh, health problems by exposure to the smokestack industries, and now we have other problems that we get from sitting too long, from sitting all day, that we're just beginning to realize how serious those problems are. And so the type of industry has changed, but there still are occupational safety and health problems, and, and they, uh, they, uh, what happens to us at work affects what happens at home and vice versa. And the workplace has a role to play in both occupational safety and health, traditional occupational safety and health, and well-being. 
and NIOSH has recognized that, and that's part of the reason that they developed the concept of uh, total worker health. Why is this important? Well, um, this graph, uh, uh, map of the country, shows the non-fatal injuries and uh, illness incidence rates by state. You, the darker they are, the, except for the gray ones, the higher the rates are. So it varies across the country. But you can see down at the bottom of the slide, for every 100 workers every year, three, uh, three or four of them, three and a half of them, um, will have an injury or an, or an illness that occurred as, at work. And we can't forget that uh, 12 to 13 people die each day uh, at work. When, when the OSHA Act was passed, it was 38 people per day died um, at work. So things have improved very significantly, but 12 to 13 is still not acceptable. So these are uh, injuries and illnesses that happen at work, but we also have to look at our uh, overall health. And this is the BRFSS map, you know, the um, surveys that they do by a phone that CDC does of tens of thousands of people in the United States. Um, and this particular map relates to self-reported, because these phone interviews, uh, self-reported obesity rates. And of course, they don't report their obesity rates, they report their height and their weight, and then that, that's recalculated. Um, but if you look at it, about 20 to 25 percent of the country is in the obese range, which is at a BMI of 30 or above. And so that affects health. And this is just one of many measures of our kind of overall health. Um, obesity, diabetes, sleep apnea double the risk of accidents in truck drivers. Health affects occupational safety or is interrelated with occupational, sa uh, occupational safety. Duke University and hospital employees with a BMI of 40 or more. So 30 is obese. 40 is, is really very uh, well into the obese range, um, have double the number of work comp claims. And the number of work loss days is 13, when they have an accident, is uh, 13 times more than those that have a BMI less than 25. And that's 184 days versus 14. It's a huge number when you think about it. So health affects safety. Safety affects health. So my challenge to you, or my challenge maybe to myself to convince you, is why you should build a total worker health program, is to build a healthy and productive workforce. Because if we're not healthy, we are not productive. To reduce accident and work comp costs. And NIOSH has essentially redefined occupational safety and health as total worker health. They've, they have redefined it. They've been evolving that concept since 1970. And they've now redefined it as total worker health. So, it now is our charge to take on total worker health as, our, as occupational safety and health. And uh, it is total worker health is safety and health, including well-being. And I do want to make the point that individual behavior is important. And Pat kind of set the stage for this in her introduction. So when there's water on the floor, somebody's got to pick up the mop to clean it up. We can't engineer out everything. Um, when people are working um, on uh, high areas, they have to connect to the, to the wires, the fall protection, to prevent them from falling off. But they've got to connect. Um, it can't be done for them. And when you think of today's uh, information industry, this is a picture from a call center where everybody has got a sit-stand desk. One person is standing. The rest are sitting. People have to take advantage of the uh, environment that they're handed. But it's the job of, in, of industry to create a good, safe, and healthy environment, and then to help people learn how to take advantage of it. So NIOSH has made the point that there's really no better place to affect healthy lifestyles than at the workplace by changing the environment and encouraging healthy behaviors, just as we've improved safety by following the hierarchy of controls, which I'm sure if you're in occupational safety and health, you've heard of from a long t for a long time. The uh, graphic that's on the board is really one that came, was developed as a CDC NIOSH graphic that was developed early. And it's really related to chemical exposures. 
uh, elimination, substitution of, chem of safer chemicals for more toxic chemicals and engineering controls. Well, it needs to be applied throughout occupational safety and health, and that is basically to sort of restate the hierarchy of controls is to begin to create a safe and healthy environment to set policies and guidelines and then to coach individual behavior to take advantage of that environment. So that's, in my thinking, the new restatement of the hierarchy of controls. It's mine, it's not Nyasha. So, um, so when we became an, a, a total worker health center, um, we sat down and said, well, our job is to figure out if total worker health programs really are effective and, and if an integration key concept in total worker health, if it's valuable to integrate safety and health with well-being kinds of uh, uh, things and so we, uh, kinds of programs. And so we said, is there an evidence base? Now, we put in our application, we'd been funded, but we didn't really know. <laughs> so we said, we better look at this literature real closely. I'm sure Iowa's done something similar. <laughs> Um, so we developed a search strategy, as you might uh, guess, and we searched the science databases, PubMed, PsychInfo, for the terms that are shown up on the board. We found about 3,700 titles and about 183 articles um, after reading the abstract. The title and the abstract looked that they were worth looking at closely, and then we um, uh, uh, and so then that's how we selected the articles that we're going to search for. But before I say more about it, I'll go back to that slide. You notice the words health promotion is up on, on the board. But um, NIOSH is changing the messaging surrounding total worker health. When it, was sta when it started, NIOSH said health, total worker health is integration of health protection and health promotion. Um, but as time went on, what they found was that the focus in health promotion seemed all to be on the individual and not on creating a healthy environment. So they decided that was the wrong messaging. And so they're not changing the messaging surrounding health protection, traditional safety and health, but they are eliminating in their 150,000 pages on their website. <laughs> Good luck on that. Um, uh, health promotion and wellness. They are expunging those words from that website and they're being replaced by well-being and probably something else as well. It's an evolutionary stage and we just learned about that change in messaging in March of this year. So they're still in the process of it. But they've sent a goal of 90 days. They're going to have a new messaging and a completely new uh, changes on the website. Like I say, good luck on that website. <laughs> For our literature review, back to that, um, well-being and health promotion and wellness are all treated as describing total worker health. They do describe it, total worker health, so they're included in our, those terms are included in our definition. But since I thought you may have heard that NIOS is changing the messaging, I thought I would mention that and then mention that it, um, that messaging came the month before our paper appeared in print. So we included those terms in our searches. So our selection criteria were that the articles had to be analyzed with inferential statistics and published in peer-reviewed journals, of course. Uh, they had to employ, now this is the key to it, the definition is they had to employ both traditional op op occupational safety and health and wellness or well-being interventions in the same study. That is, the, the program had to have both uh, health protection and wellness or well-being or um, uh, in, in the same program. And they had to report measures of both traditional occupational safety and, and well-being outcomes. So they had to have both kinds of interventions. They had to report measures of both kinds of interventions. But they didn't have to have st statistically significant findings in those, uh, in both. Just, uh, they didn't have to have any at all. In fact, one didn't. So guess how many published total worker health interventions did we find through November of 2013? What do you think? Like 200, 100, 50, I'm going in the right direction. <laughs> 17 is what we find that met our definition. So um, how do we define health protection and health promotion? So this is kind of the critical part of it. We took it from the NIOSH website 
and a chapter by Shillen Chosewood in 2003, or an article by Shillen Chosewood in 2013. And each of those on the website, um, I don't know if you can still find it because this is going to change dramatically, but um, this is what's also in their chapter. And these are the issues related to total worker health. And the uh, protection issues, the occupational safety and health issues, are identified in this uh, grouping up there. So you can see there are chemical exposures, biological agents, and there are two of them that might seem new to you because they didn't show up in the early days of occupational safety and health, but they, they have shown up over time. And, and NIOSH has defined uh, traditional occupational safety and health, and they did this years ago as including psychosocial factors and, and organization of work. So these were our occupational safety and health programs and measures of these, of these uh, areas. And then our health promotion area um, were defined by uh, these areas that um, will seem familiar to you as well. Uh, healthier behaviors, uh, health and well-being assessments, and so forth, aging productively, and so forth. So they had to have one from column A and one from column C to meet our definition. All right. So the first question you might ask, and we asked, is are these programs really total? What is total worker health? How many of, how many of these things do you have to have to be a total worker health program? Well, I'm not going to answer that question in this, in this presentation. We haven't answered it for ourselves. We might ask the folks from uh, Iowa if they've answered it. Um, but of the 17 articles, two of them were very large-scale, company-wide makeover programs. They covered the waterfront. There's no question that anyone would agree that these were total uh, programs. Um, there were also three of the studies that were substantial well-being and health and safety components in it. So they also looked very total and, and very substantial, very comprehensive. So I would call them comprehensive programs. There are also seven of the articles that had one really broad area, say it, be it health promotion or health protection, and the other was more specific or had a narrow target to it. So it, had, it met our definition, but it wasn't as full-featured in both health promotion and health protection. Only one of them would be considered to be somewhat full-featured. And then five of them addressed a specific problem or tested a specific method. And one might be very familiar to you because it was done here by Nico Pronk in this, in this area with uh, sit-stand desks. But he had an exercise component, so he had a wellness component, he had an ergonomics component to it, so it met our definition of total worker health um, intervention programs. So these are the 17 articles represented there. What about the study designs? Do they use strong designs? Um, well, nine of them use randomized trials. Eight of them use pr actually pretty strong quasi-experimental designs. And there's one extra one in there because one study kind of used one for the wellness component and one for the safety and health, one design for the safety and health component. But it was still done at one time as a singular study, just analyzed differently. And the mean, median number of people in those trials were about 671 people. So of the 17 published interventions, where were they conducted? Well, most of them were conducted in, man in uh, manufacturing and in services. What years were they done in? Well, they started in 19, uh, 1990, and the last one we identified before our search ended was in 2012. And so you can see they stretched over, over the, the years. Of course, none of them were called total worker health because that term didn't come into being until 2011. And what countries will they, were they done in? Most of them were done in the United States, but some were done in, in Europe and Australia and so forth. Well, did they improve things? Were they effective? What happened as a result of these programs? And of these 17 interventions, one of them didn't improve anything, didn't have any statistically significant improvements. I'm going to go to that journal and try and publish there, because I've got a couple of <laughs> studies where we had no effects. I'd love to publish. Um, so apparently, there are journals that will take those. Um, and there were um, uh, the 16 that improved between 1 and 19 risk factors. And, and they improved 19, 18, 12. You can see the number of risk factors or actual effects that were improved, uh, health effects that were improved in the right-hand side of the column and the uh, authors of the paper in the left-hand. And then these are the others. So it goes from 19 down to, well, zero. 
And which ones had the strong designs, the randomized control designs? They're the ones identified in yellow, same grouping, but now you can see what, which ones had the randomized control trial designs. But as I said, the other designs were actually pretty good designs. So just to look at the two that did the 18 and the 19, you're not going to want to read these. I'm not going to read them to you, but just to show you that the ones that are in red were actually biometric measures of weight, blood pressure, cholesterol, hospital admissions, health-related expenses, and the others were uh, self-reported information, but using mostly standardized scales. So were there changes across studies? How can we look across the, the studies? So there were uh, 79 measures, if you look at all those 17 studies and count the total, because we looked at every measure in every study. Um, it's an exhaustive review. It was exhausting, I know, at the time. Um, so there were 79 actual measures used in these 17 studies, some overlapping, some not. Um, and in the, uh, the uh, occupational safety and health measures, two of them were sitting time and seatbelt use. Um, and in well-being and wellness, the ones that, where there were at least two studies that used them, or ones I'm showing here, were smoking, weight, blood pressure, cholesterol, and exercise frequency. So th those are the number of studies in which these measures were collected. So our conclusion from that is there really isn't much replication. And when you look at the studies, they didn't do, say, study one with intervention one in company X and then go to company Y and repeat that in that. You know, we don't have replication, which would be the definition of replication. There's, there's a little bit in the smoking programs that are pretty close, I'd call replications, but generally not the case in, in all these studies. And safety isn't as frequently addressed. Now, that's been a worry for those of us in occupational safety and health. With this rush to deal with wellness of people, to, take, to, to deal with those kinds of lifestyle issues, are people forgetting the fundamental safety and health? Are we going to go back to having 38 people die on the job every year? And so that's, that's been our, our real worry and the sort of the core worry of people in the ERCs, I know, edu education research centers, are, are we forgetting about safety and just w dealing with wellness and well-being. So it, it worries us. And um, we, I, I think all of us in this field feel that safety is the foundation. We have to make sure that strong safety programs are in place as we integrate in wellness and well-being kinds of programs as well. So just to mention that this is a worry. And if people, if you've heard people worry about or complain about total worker health. That's the biggest worry or the biggest complaint. So we all, those of us doing total worker health fully recognize that and are committed to um, not allowing safety to be forgotten. So what's the big picture? Um, our big picture statement is the total worker health literature is developing and heterogeneous. It is nothing on which to draw conclusions and identify gaps because it's all gaps. <laughs> I look on this as an opportunity. There are so many things that we can do. And I would say that if you're interested in doing total worker health um, in the workplace or research on it in the workplace, kind of now is our time. Now is our time to be doing this because it's important for our country, it's important for our state, and it's important for our individual companies that are the you know, lifeblood of this, of this country. So it is an opportunity to get in there and uh, develop total worker health programs and evaluate them. And there will be plenty of opportunities to publish those if you're in academia. These are not models of total worker health, these programs and these articles, but they are examples that you can use. So the next question we asked is, are they good examples? Are they really having a positive impact? And so we started looking at that, and, and we decided we'd ask the question, do these total worker health study interventions stack up well against uh, focused or single outcome interventions um, that have been done? So total worker health interventions trying to change a bunch of things. Focused interventions are trying to change one thing, say, reduce weight. Redu quitting smoking, single things, whereas total worker health, bigger programs. So of the 79 outcome measures, we, we picked those that changed in at least three studies, so we'd have data ac across the studies to compare it to, and they turned out to be weight, exercise, smoking, blood pressure, and cholesterol, the ones that you saw on the previous slide. 
So we looked for meta-analyses or systematic analyses of these focused interventions that analyzed for the same outcome variables as in the total worker health study and measured them in the same way. Now, as you can imagine, we couldn't get perfect exact matches, but we could come fairly close. And so um, how do these changes stack up? Well, let's take the weight changes. First of all, in the total worker health interventions, there was actually only one that changed weight, uh, reduced weight in a positive direction, and it is the one, one of the ones I have a conflict for because we used my training program in this project. Um, in fact, I'm one of the authors of this project. So in that project, um, weight was, re it was really a combination of reducing weight and reducing uh, overspeeding and hard braking in truck drivers and uh, increasing exercise and so forth. So the weight changes were uh, about 7.8 pounds lost in six months and they used weight loss competitions. We used weight loss competitions, uh, competitions, incentives, and actually motivational interviewing. And that's the kind of the expensive part. So we kind of threw the kitchen sink at them, tried to have a st very strong intervention. And what about focused interventions? Well, there was a meta-analysis by Archer et al. in 2011 where they looked at weight loss competitions and incentive programs, um, and they didn't use motivational interviewing. Um, and they found weight loss is about uh, a mean in the meta-analysis of about 6.2 pounds. So by comparison, the total worker health intervention um, did uh, re lead to more weight loss, which was one of the goals. So continuing on this, how does this stack up? Looking at exercise, in an attempt to increase exercise to more than two and a half times per week at about 20 or 30 minutes per day, um, the total worker health pro programs increased it compared to controls in the intervention group, increased it by 18%. The number, percentage of people that were doing exercises at two, more than two and a half times per week and in, in, in the FOCUS program, uh, in a meta-analysis, the best of the, uh, in a systematic analysis, the best of the programs increased um, exercise by 9.7% to two and a half times per week. Use the same definition. Um, smoking quit rates, total worker health, Four to nine percent focus programs, meta-analysis, 4.2 percent. Uh, systolic blood pressure, total worker health, six to 12.79 millimeters mercury in total worker health program in the focus program, um, minus 4.4 um, mill millimeters of mercury. And in cholesterol, um, and this is the good cholesterol increasing it, so it in, the total worker health programs increased it by 0.26 and the focused ones 0.065. So I'll come back to this in a minute, but what about safety? Well, the one total worker health study that looked at safety looked at work comp costs and claims in the fire departments that they were studying and uh, that they were doing an intervention in, total worker health intervention in. This was done at my university, but I, didn't, I wasn't involved in it. Um, and they found uh, over a five-year period by comparing the total worker health pro uh, programs with the or firefighting fire organizations, they were county and state and city organizations, uh, firefighting organizations, they, they um, uh, reduced compared to the controls that didn't have the program, they had reduction of $550 per year and reduced work comp claims by 12%. And I couldn't find any focused interventions to compare them to, so. All right, does this give us the full picture? Well, of course not. Um, but overall, I think we can say that, um, because we, these aren't exact comparisons, these are just, we're trying to get an idea of things, if things are in the ballpark, and overall, things are, the, the changes that are being uh, affected by the total worker health programs, when compared to focused interventions, in the measures of weight, they, the one study that found an improvement in weight, um, uh, that it was the most effective and exceeded the average of the, of the meta-analysis of the focus programs. And for smoking, exercise, cholesterol, and blood pressure, they all bested the average. Now, what I think this says is there's no penalty for implementing total worker health in interventions. I'm not gonna say they're better. You, th that comparison doesn't tell you that. But what it says is you're not gonna uh, have a penalty um, uh, of not being as effective if you have a good total worker health intervention. 
um, as saying, well, no, I'll do focused. I'll do weight this year and I'll do ergonomics next year. And then, you know, you don't, you can, you don't have to do them piecemeal. You're not going to have a penalty for doing them, uh, total worker health interventions. Well, what about sustainability? Um, the, it doesn't really matter if it isn't sustained. We all know programs where people have lost a lot of weight or done something and then the next year they're right back up again. So the two large-scale ongoing programs, which are Bertera and Dalton and Harris, and they were done early on, long ago really, collected measures after two to, after two to four years. So it was clear, and they were the ones that, two of the ones that had a lot of changes. Uh, in, intervention changes um, in uh, measures of or outcome measures of risk factors, um, they were they were finding effects that were ongoing. Of course, they implemented these programs in these companies, and they continued in these companies. It wasn't a program they just introduced, bang, and something happened, and then the company went on. They introduced them, and it was a continuous, ongoing program. Most of the programs have been done like people like me, like university professors, and, and we develop interventions, and we put these packages into place, and the, the programs are in, in place, but we're not there to sustain that program. It's the company has to decide to do that. So, um, and the, I should have said the two large-scale programs, one was a manufacturing company, and one was a telecommunications company, both large companies. So that was two of the, of, the measure, of the total worker health studies. Nine other interventions measured at um, more than one year um, uh, found, uh, found effects that were sustained at least at the one-year period, which is kind of one of those measures. If it's at one year, you, things have changed and have changed kind of continuously. And they were in a lot of different industries, firefighting, manufacturing, wind, wind power, uh, trucking, uh, universities, car manufacturing, and uh, apprenticeship programs. So it wasn't just concentrated in a single industry, it was kind of across the board. That they found outcomes improved um, at more than one year. Okay, um, what about the work comp claims that I mentioned from the FLAME study, the firefighter study? Well, in fact, those rates were data from two years after the intervention. So they were showing, again, sustainability. What about return on investment? You go and sell something to a company. Here, we want you to use our program. The first question they're going to ask is, what's the return on investment? Well, not a lot of studies really focus on return on investment, but there were a couple. The FLAME study um, found that for every $4.61 invested, uh, or for every dollar invested, there was a return of $4.61. This was over a five-year period. And they were in medical and work comp claim uh, comp costs. And Bertera, one of those early studies at year two, found a uh, return on investment of a little over $2 for every dollar in, of invested. And they just measured the cost of disability days. Now, um, what about focused programs? Well, Verbeek et al. Um, in 2009 looked at systematic safety interventions. And he, he, uh, they did not look at re, um, uh, they, well, what they looked at was recovery of investment in one year. At the end of one year, had the investment that they'd put into it um, uh, as measured in reduced sick leave time costs, had they recovered it. And they found that in 19 of the 26, they had re recovered their investment in one year. And they may not have been entirely focused programs. They may be a little bit broader. I didn't really look into that. The other one's fairly famous review, the health promotion programs. It was a meta-analysis by Baker et al., in 2010, just looking at health promotion and looking at medical cost savings. And this, these were strong uh, programs that had strong research designs, and they found a little over $3.27 return for, per dollar. So these programs are showing good return on investment. If you're going to a company to sell them on developing a program in total, in total worker health or even in health promotion, then that is, uh, you have something to bring to those companies to say it can really help your bottom line. What about dissemination? Well, to me, dissemination is to take a complete package of materials, the steps that you have to take, and some, things that can be implemented by like non-specialists, like people that are the safety professionals, the people in the HR department that may not be really specialists in total worker health. And that's, to me, what it takes to um, uh, have a true 
uh, package for dissemination. So out of those 17 interventions, how many do you think, this is your second test, nobody answered the first one, how many do you think um, uh, there's, an, there's a dissemination uh, package for that you could go out and buy? Okay, how many think it's more than one? Nobody. So everybody is right. There's exactly one, and that was the FLAME program at OHSU, and you could go to Cancer Planet and find how to get the, the program itself. So it's, it is a, this one is available. The rest are not. I wrote to everybody. I wrote to all these scientists. I said, you know, have you got your program? And my colleague, <laughs> Ryan Olson, we have one of those programs in there. It'd be so easy for us to make a package, put it out there. Well, we're improving it, you know. So, um, and of course, some came from companies where it was proprietary. They didn't want to give that up. It was their program, so maybe it's not too surprising. But the problem is that when we do research in universities, oftentimes that program sits on the shelf. It maybe gets publication. We get promoted. We become you know, professor of this or that. But it's really critical to get it disseminated, and I think we need to focus on that more. And that's my strong burning interest at the present time. So what are my conclusions or our conclusions from the review? Because all the PIs from the uh, principal investigators from our Oregon Healthy Workforce Center uh, are authors on this and wrote the, the article, including the director now of the Iowa Center, Diane Rollman, is one of our PIs in our program. She went to Iowa um, after we wrote this paper together, all of us. Um, and I think what the conclusions are is that there is a strong argument for the efficiency of total worker health for addressing both injuries and chronic diseases versus arguably more expensive focused programs. And I say arguably because to put in place a total worker health program, there is more to do. There are more measures to create. There are more, you have to convince people to do it, and it takes more time sometimes because there are more time uh, consuming programs because you are dealing with more things. The education program has to be broader than if you're just dealing with a simple ergonomic issue, for example. And this is listed, our article was just published in April in uh, Journal of Occupational Psychology. It's available, I'll mention it again later. But that's the, our, that's the conclusion we came to it. And, I, and we feel that these 17 articles provide a rich set of examples of how these interventions can, in fact, be uh, structured and the evidence for their effectiveness. So you can say, are these really worth doing? And they are open access, and it's an open access article in the Journal of Occupational Health Psychology. We paid for that so people could download the um, uh, article. And if you then look in the, in the article, there's um, uh, right on the first page under the abstract, it shows that there are supplemental materials. And so what we did was we took every study and we wrote a summary of it, and it looks like this, and it shows... Um, what the purpose of the, of the study was, what was the health promotion and what was the OSH implementation, what was their strategy, what was their rationale. And every measure they used, whether changed significantly or didn't change significantly, is listed in the right-hand column. So it's useful if you want to pick apart, apart a program and to um, consider implementing it. And it's free. So. What features were used in these uh, programs, these total worker health programs? Well, I'll divide them into four categories. And the first one is antecedents individual. They used a lot of health risk assessments or needs assessments. There were 11 studies that did either an HRA or an organizational needs assessment. And about nine of them used formal, or exactly nine of them used formalized or scripted training. For example, of the type um, where they had an educational card that they could learn from. Um, in the, in the tra and be trained into how to be, have a healthy lifestyle or to work safely. And organizational, incentive, uh, organizational antecedents, um, employee involvement was involved in nine of the studies, environment changes. Um, for example, you see the chip or the, the vending machine up there. They changed things like taking out all the candy and, or, or some of the candy because I've never seen anybody take out all the candy <laughs> and put in apples and things like that. Well, that's more expensive, but I mean, they did made, they changed the environment, and that's really a critical step in this. They also had activities like health fairs, eight of the studies did, and they did system or policy changes. 
Procedures to support behavior change. Those have changed in the organization and the environment. What about procedures to support behavior change? Well, group or team strategies, that's what we've used the most, were used in five of the studies. That is where they brought people together, for example, in the picture shown, uh, around learning something about safety or about health. This is actually a group of people in a, um, a current study that we're working with home care workers. Some use, four studies use motivational interviewing or counseling. Now, that's great, but the problem with that is they're expensive because you have individual people going and talking to people, and so it's effective, but it's also expensive. A couple of programs use self-monitoring or self-management and, and so forth. And then consequences. Five of the programs use feedback on how things were going, if people were improving or doing well. Four of them used incentives for participation, and I'm a strong supporter of that because I think if they don't get to the table, they're not going to learn anything. And some of them used uh, incentives for improvement. And a picture of that from the SHIFT project, again, that's one I have a conflict with, is shown up there where they had a dashboard um, where they were improving, uh, getting people not to overspeed the truck drivers and getting them not to do hard braking, which happens when you're about to have an accident, so they're more watchful, and for weight loss and for um, increased exercise. And so they actually had a competition and incentives for successfully uh, doing the best in all those measures. Um, so those were consequences. So what do you need? If you're going to develop your own total worker health program, is you need to begin with, and I'm, I'm hoping that <laughs> I've convinced you that it's important to do and that some of these programs are worth uh, testing or implementing. Um, you need to have a theory or a, or a rationale or a vision. You've got to, this is what I expect to happen here. A lot of these total worker health programs were not theory based. They didn't, they just said, okay, we're going to make a change. And, and, but you need to have at least a rationale or a vision of how things are going to change. And you need to engage the entire organization from the beginning. If the CEO isn't involved, it isn't going to happen. They, everybody from the CEO to the people on the plant floor, the person who locks the door at the end of the day, they have to be involved or engaged in developing a total worker health program. You need to do a needs assessment, of course. Um, you need to have measures of those needs, because sometimes you'll know there's a problem, but you don't have measure of it. You've got to have measures of it to see if your program is effective, because if you don't have data on your program to show that it's effective, then it isn't going to be maintained, and they're going to wonder why they, they paid all that money for it. You need methods and procedures, and I think, again, following that sort of hierarchy of controls, you need to create the safe and healthy environment. You need to create a safe and healthy climate, and you need to change behavior from the manager, from the CEO, all the way down to the um, everybody in the organization, I guess I should say. Well, how have we done it? Because we've done some total worker health pro uh, programs. Um, and our Oregon Healthy Workforce Center, our theme is intervention effectiveness. And um, you see there the pictures of the PIs that did our projects, including Diane Rollman down there at the bottom, who's also the director now of the Iowa Center. Um, and our theme was intervention effectiveness. And as Pat said, all of our studies were done using randomized controlled trials. And the studies were team-based interventions in home care workers, and that's Ryan Olson shown to the right of the picture of the PI that led that. Um, same team-based interventions in corrections officers, Carrie Keel, city construction workers, Leslie Hammer, commercial construction workers, me, and then a young worker study that was a program that was different that used the NIOSH Talking Safety Program implemented in computer-based training. And I should say all the people that have um, asterisks next to them, I have a conflict with because they use my, my computer-based training program. It's the content that's important <laughs> that, that they developed um, that's in it. So at any rate, she developed that program and for City Parks and Recreation Department for the summer workers there. So those are the programs. And then we also had common measures across all those programs. Um, not a lot, but a small number of them, and they all went into our data repository, and that was overseen by the Kaiser Center for Health Research um, uh, pro program, one of, which is one of our parts of our center. 
So I'll talk just a little bit about a specific one, just to give you an example of what it's like. And this is our home care worker project that Ryan Olson is the uh, PI of. Home care workers have an isolated work st structure and they have unique hazards and stressors, perhaps um, identified in the top picture and in, in the bottom picture on the screen. And so a home care worker goes into somebody's home and in Oregon, the patient or the client, whatever their name is, um, they're also in Oregon called the consumer employer, they're also the boss. They hire you as a home care worker and they can fire you as the home care worker. And they are responsible for the security, the safety and health, the wellness program, everything. And well, we all know that, that, that the patients are not trained or to, uh, for that, to do that kind of thing. So it's a unique environment that's very different from the kind of environment that any of the rest of us work in. And it's a difficult one to work in. Injuries are about four times the average um, for all workers, and uh, there are psychological and physical health problems that they have to deal with. And this um, uh, occupation is going to grow by almost 50% by 2018, people taking care of us at home. So it's an important and growing population. The intervention he called COMPASS. They had a monthly meeting structure where they had scripted education programs. They had a work-life check-in, which is shown on the, on, in the picture on the left. And they had a scripted work play, workbook lesson, and they had take-home goals. They had social support. They had a shared meal at these monthly meetings. They had work-life support, which was really just kind of education related to healthy lifestyles and safe, safe life. Uh, lifestyles and uh, were work practices, and they had a reflection period. So this was the intervention program. So it was kind of considerable. And they were paid to come there. They were paid the, the wage they would get as if they were working, which is the same way they'd be paid if they were taking training from the Home Care Commission in Oregon. And they found at um, six months, I'm sorry, I've got 12 months up there. It should say six months up there. The 12-month data are in, but they're not published, so I'm not going to show them to you. <laughs> but I'm smiling. Um, <laughs> so at six months, there are, com there are significant improvements in communities of practice. People came together. They, they formed kind of like a little mini support group to deal with um, uh, the problems that they had so they could learn from each other about the problems that each one had and ha learn other people's solutions to their own problems. They increased safety behaviors. They increased tool use. They talked with their employer more about safety issues, about wellness, about the health, their health uh, kinds of issues, according to self-report, of course. And then they increased tool use. And you see that one of the key tools down at the bottom, they'd never heard of this. It's a lifting tool. Well, of course, if you've got a patient in bed, often they're heavy or obese, um, not in the picture. But if you've got to get them out of bed, lifting them out of bed. And of course, there are no patient lifts like we have in so many hospitals now. So how do you get them up? Well, there's a tool you can use if both of you grab onto it where you can help pull people out of the bed that is not nearly so hard on their backs because there just is not another alternative for them. So they started doing that. They also, in terms of health behaviors, health-related behaviors, they were, according to their self-reporting, eating less sugary snacks. And they're now, um, with the 12-month results out, they're now adapting this for statewide dissemination through the Home Care Commission in Oregon. So that's kind of an individual example of a, of a project that, that we've done, of a total worker health project. So, Healthy Workforce Center, um, if you want to learn more about us or see what we're doing on a daily basis, we have a blog. We get like three to 4,000 hits per month on that blog. We get a lot of hits on it. And um, we have Facebook and Twitter accounts. And there most of us are up there. And I want to acknowledge all the co-authors in in, that on this uh, project, including uh, Diane Rollman um, from the Iowa Center. And then uh, the two people at the end have been helping with the literature review. So thank you. Oh, my name is Ephraim Gabriel. I'm an occupational medicine physician uh, from Minneapolis VA. Um, thank you for lucid uh, and very comprehensive presentation. 
Um, first, you know, a kind of a brief comment that the total health is, the name total is, in my opinion, it's misleading because it's been called by different names, comprehensive health, etc. cetera. Uh, for instance, most of the intervention, it doesn't involve mental health in work, workplace, uh, which is, which makes uh, workers susceptible for injury, uh, weight gain, both for uh, accident as well as uh, uh, general health. Uh, so uh, again, it's, it's the name thing, uh, whether total health is really total, uh, I don't know. Uh, having said that, uh, some of the European industries uh, combine work environment with uh, medical services on the same side, uh, mm -hmm. big industries like auto industries and aircraft industries and so on. I was wondering if you looked at that kind of, uh, besides the, uh, the wellness programs uh, and other intervention, when general health delivery system is combined with work environment, whether that has inf any impact. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, of course, I'm not responsible for total worker health, <laughs> um, except in the programs we develop. And certainly mental health is a part of some of the, of some of the total worker health programs. As I said early on, I, and I think I've got your question right, or questions right, um, but a little of it was indistinct, so you can come back. Um, but um, there are programs that have involved mental health and uh, mental health kinds of issues. In fact, our home care worker uh, program did involve uh, addressing those by bringing together as a community of practice as kind of a support group, and they did have a mental health topic in there. And so some of them do. But as I said in uh, the early part of my presentation, um, what we don't know what makes total worker health in a sense because it is so huge. If you look at all the issues that were on that one issue slide that you saw at first, and NIOSH is actually enlarging those, it is a huge, it is a huge area, and, and, so, and the needs are great. And so the needs assessment is really the clue to figuring out what it is that your program needs to address. And those needs assessments often do have a mental health component assessment in it. Um, I have a follow-up point. Uh, actually, one of the problems with intervention is sustainability. There is a placebo effect. Initially, when in, you do some kind of intervention, you kind of uh, attract people who are motivated uh, in health improvement or health protection. You see some kind of good results but it dies down or uh, kind of goes to back to the uh -huh. baseline. Um, has this, any of the studies a pro, uh, long, long effect assessment of any intervention? Uh, so I talked about sustainability, and that's really what you're talking about, is it not? So there were um, 11 of the programs that showed um, effects were measured at the one year or greater time period. And two of them were, uh, were measured at two to, two to five years after. Um, actually, three of them measured things at two to five years. So there was sustainability. But as I, as I said at one point, I think these programs have to be implemented and sort of introduced into the culture so that the climate and the culture at the workplace changes. And they're built as, as ongoing programs, um, not as just one-offs where you introduce the program and then you give it to them, then you take off, and then you're on to your next industry or your next company. So um, th there is clearly sustainability in some of these programs. And you may be familiar with the multiple health behavior uh, studies that have been done. That's another one where they have found sustainability in some of those programs. They're just wellness programs. They are only wellness programs. Yeah. So um, my name is Amy. I'm from 3M in Cottage Grove. I'm an occupational health nurse. My question is about sustainability. And um, looking at the, the participating players in that ongoing sustainability, um, if a total worker program is put into place, who are the champions of that in a building? And are there any ratios on how many employees you need 
to be the ones who help promote and sustain for the workers? Yeah, that's, that's really a good question. Um, it, it's, it's clear that upper management has to be committed to the program, and they've got to be in the room all the time um, and, and pushing that program. If, if, if the CEO, if upper management is not in the room participating in it, it isn't going to happen. It isn't going to keep on happening. Um, we have seen cases where things seem to get to critical mass, and all of a sudden there really is a culture change. Uh, and uh, bike riding is an example where in a group that um, two or three people start riding their bike to work, and then other people thought, hey, I guess I can do this, and pretty soon everybody was riding their bike to work. And it was clear what happened is there was a culture change that took place in there. And, and that's what's going to happen. And I, I, I wish I could tell you what it takes to make that. And if I could, I would be so wealthy. <laughs> um, but um, So I, I'm not sure what it is, but I'm sure upper management has to be involved. I'm sure safety and health and well, the people that do safety and health and well, wellness need to be really on top of that and, and really promoting that in a, in a strong way. And then, and then you've got to get a lot of interested people uh, working on it. And, and what we found is when the CEO signs up, almost everybody signs up for the program. So to me, that's really the big key. I'm Ben Bornstein. Thank you for a very interesting, excellent presentation um, based on evidence. Um, I'm interested in graduate medical education, especially in the area of uh, preventive medicine specialties. So this is the concept of total worker health disseminating or being translated into the goals and objectives of the training for physicians in occupational medicine. <laughs> um, I, I think that question probably has to be asked school of medicine by school of medicine. And I... Um, we, we are working on that at our, at our university, but it's a hard nut to crack. So I, I, can't, I just can't answer the question. I don't know if that's being done effectively. I, I know it's a challenge. Thank you. Wish I could give back. Uh, I can say that NIOSH has been trying to raise that conversation among programs in occupational medicine, as well as all the other disciplines that are working in occupational health and safety, like nursing, industrial hygiene. So they're just beginning to think about what does it mean to try and change the workforce in health and safety to start thinking this way, and what are the, what, what's the knowledge and skills that are necessary to do that. Thanks, Kate. Yeah. There's an interesting article that's just come out um, to attempt to look at integrating health protection, health promotion just came out, I think, today or y yesterday, where they actually have um, metrics for it um, and, and sort of they define how programs can develop and how you can measure those programs. And, and I'm pretty sure that was a, a part of those, of those programs. But I'd be glad to give you the reference to that. I've got it somewhere. Hi. Uh, Neil Carlson, Environmental Health and Safety. The question I have is you've got two different methods that you have when you start out the program. You have a certain energy that you have to have for initiating the program, and then what changes when you go to the sustainability model, when you make that transition, and how do you switch the incentives, because sometimes the incentives keep ramping up, and how do you switch that out? Can you talk to that? Um, so. The, the incentives for participation are, I think, critical to get people started doing things, particularly where there's a lot of voluntary issues related to it. And, and I think the policies have to be there um, to support it, and then the incentives bring people to the table. And so um, do you then give incentives for production, you know, for people to make changes in this freak amount of time they send, spend standing or sitting, uh, not, not sitting but standing, um, and things of that sort, wellness kinds of issues. You give them incentives for that. They've been very productive, and if they're done for things that make you feel better or make you feel healthier, there is r good reason to hope that the natural contingencies take over and 
you just continue with those. And what we've done to um, uh, maintain the things uh, is we've developed sort of uh, ways of getting people to practice things. And one of our investigators has developed an app where you can track your own behavior in terms of frequency of, you know, uh, exercise and activity and things like that. Um, so we, we've developed practice activities for everything because once you give people the education, that's great, but they have to put it into practice where it becomes habitual. And once they do that, and that may take incentives to get that to happen. We, we do use incentives for that. And at that point, once the natural contingencies are there and they're feeling healthier and they've lost weight and their back isn't hurting and they're, you know, they're feeling better because they're standing more and they're not sitting as much, then, then those, those incentives aren't, aren't so important. I've never seen a study, though, where they've investigated like the dose of the training, the dose of the incentive, and how quickly you can drop it off. So I, I can't really answer the question. But the, the answer has got to be in the natural contingencies taking over so that, you know, I, I don't need that anymore, that incentive anymore. I'm going to keep doing it because I feel better and I'm healthier. So. And with that, I think we'll have to wrap up. We have a, um, a reception waiting outside along with student posters. But I really want to thank Dr. Inger for a great presentation. Oh, thank you.